Hi, and welcome to the presentation about calls for welfare. I'm a zookeeper at Copenhagen Zoo, where I've been employed since 1999. I began at the carnivore section, so my first training experience was with wolves and bears. I've been lucky to be mentored by Annette Pillersen, uh, who also works at the zoo. In 2003, I then moved to the uh, sea lion section, um, and then the training really started kicking off. In about 2013, we got the Vaders uh, into our section, a big free flight Avery. Um, and then in 2014, we started on the training of the birds. The species at the Avery, that is Scarlet Ibis, Black-Faced Ibis, Inca Terns, Caribbean Flamingos, um, Black-Necked Delts and Ring Teals. The only species that we don't have a training program for at the moment, that is our ring teals. All of the birds, they are in a breeding group, so we have to make sure that our training don't have a negative um, impact on our breeding. So the way that we set it up, both of the things work so we can still have birds out in the winter time. Um, instead of having the need to lock them up. So the Avery is a walkthrough Avery. So we got our guest uh, going on the wooden path uh, in the back of the Avery, going down to an info cabin that we use for um, guest talks about the animals, but we also use it for our training. So we can get, either we can get the Inca turns to come over and fly by and take fish uh, from the hand, or we can use it for um, explaining the difference of the different uh, beak shapes uh, of the birds by calling all the birds over on a mutual call. But our main focus uh, of training that was uh, at indoor because in Denmark we have cold winters and not all of the species work well in the winter uh, time. So we got the housing over here in two floors and then we got a little section over here for the pelicans. So we got up here, we got the, um, the flamingo section down here, and we got over here, we got for the black-faced ibis, we got for the black neck stills, the ducks, the scarlet ibis, and our Inca turns. The first picture that is to show how the Avery was looking when it first was done. It was very barren. There wasn't any trees. And like for species uh, like the, ink, the um, scarlet ibis, they like to hang out in the trees, have their nest in the trees. Um, other species like the openness, like the Inca terns. Um, but then we changed the Avery over time to try and compensate for um, these lacks. Um, and thereby we encourage the species to easily come in. So we found it quite important that um, the surrounding areas around our gates, they in some way um, encourage the species to come in or if some species were like more scared of things that were flying over their heads, for example, uh, our black stilts in the beginning they had a completely open area over here and they didn't like um, to come in when they had other species like uh, the scarlet ibis flying over their head or the inca terns um, that are two species that are extremely nosy and um, so the the stilts they rather withdrew from the training so by making cover for them um, we got them in more easily. For example, our Inca turns that are up here, uh, as you can see, there's completely cleared for any vegetation. And that's because uh, we found out that our Inca turns, they like uh, all the openness. They like to come flying by and then they can uh, overview the entire area indoor. And therefore, they just flew in. If we, we tried, once because we wanted to minimize um, the scarlet ibis from going into uh, the Inca turn section. So we put in this um, smaller doorway for the Inca turns. 
Um, it sort of like we thought it ruined our training because we we didn't see the Inca turns in when we were doing the training, but the Inca turns they would go in when we didn't do training, and that's they couldn't see us. So we, as soon as we pulled this off, uh, this um, reduction of the entrance, the Inca turns started coming in again. For the scarlet ibis, we have, um, as you know, scarlet ibis like to nest in trees. So what we did was we did some fake trees and some dead trees was put in uh, and then we planted some some real trees so it all could um, grow up and make a good nesting spot. And this encouraged the scarlet ibis to be in full view of the, the public um, also for breeding season, but it also gave the the plus on the training that the scalded ibis they were hanging out in the trees right outside where we tried to call them in. So you get some some free points um, in that direction if you think um, of how the animals work naturally. Um, the same with our black faced ibis. Um, in the beginning, we really wanted because the the section where the black faced ibis uh, is that was our spare room in the whole house. So that was where we could put in animals that we needed to monitor or anything. So we really wanted the the black faced ibis to live uh, up on the top floor with the the scarlet ibis. The thing is just that the black faced ibis they are more a ground species than the scarlet ibis is so we could get the black faced ibis to live up there until they went out the gate and as soon as they went out the gate they wouldn't come in again because they never would fly up there they'll fly up to the roof and up to the info cabin over to this side um, and sit on the roof but we couldn't get them to go in through the gates on the top floor so as soon as we moved them downstairs it took just a little while and then we got our black faced ibis coming in on on their calls too so that is just to say that there is a huge um advantage in to look at how the animals um, behave naturally and then try to create that environment around your gates um, and thereby you get some really good three points in your uh, training to succeed. Our food setup, um, we had to do it in a way so we could monitor how much the different species they were eating and um, who was eating what, where. Um, so the whole training is not to pull food from the animals, it is to provide them the set amount that they have to have in on a specific day but also gave us some problems with that both the ibis and inca terns both like fish and shellfish so what we did was to make some food inviting for some species and less inviting for others and also doing more some for some very accessible and for others inaccessible for example um, for our scarlet ibis um, they get um, ibis pellet and then they get um, the sprats and the, the clams in or the muscle meat in the breeding season and outside the breeding season we only give um, mealworms and the pellets but the Inca turn sort of was super nice just to go into the ibis to um, try and see if they can nick some of their food. And the same way around that the ibis went into the Inca turns to try and nick their food. So what we did was we pulled the food um, from all of our indoor aviaries and we then used it specifically for all our trainings. Then we have slightly in our breeding season we will have more stand uh, food in there so they will or they will get like a bigger feeding in the morning 
and then they'll be let out. But what we had to do when, especially for the breeding season, that was that we um, we took the ibis, their meat, like the fish and the mussel meat, we blended it and mixed it together with the pellets. That way we got the ibis better to eat their pellets, so that was like a plus. But we also got that Inca turn thought that the, f the food was disgusting, so they didn't want to eat it. So that way we we won there. Um, so the Inca turns, they only fly into themselves um, to feed. But we also did because we got other species that liked the porridge that we made. So we did these small boxes, as you see uh, below, with mesh, and then we got different mesh sizes. So it fits to the different beak that has to eat the food. So for example, for our stilts, like um, they got a small mesh size because both the scarlet ibis and the black-faced ibis and the ducks, they find that the stilts food, that's super cool to eat. Um, so we did this smaller mesh size so they can't get their beak in and eat their food. And the same we did on top floor, um, just to make sure that if someone hasn't blended the fish properly, um, the Inca turns can't pull out um, bits. Um, an extra part is that it, it gave a prolonged eating for the birds, because instead of just going over to a bowl, now they had to put their beak down through the mesh and pull out the food. So that was a plus again. So this is a step-by-step -step plan that we did for our black neck stilts. At the time, we had um, two pairs, breeding pairs. Um, so what we did was we created um, a plan for how we would approach this. And we decided to meet the birds outdoor in the big aviary because the birds had a negative response to our presence when it was indoor in the way that they would either start yabbing or they would simply walk away. Um, so we met them where they felt safe. We decided on sound and that was a little bell that we rang. And then we picked the food type that was uh, small mealworms. Um, what's important is that you decide on a type of reward that the desired species is super fond of, for once, of course, and then that they will eat fast. Because when you work in a mixed species aviary like this, you will have a lot of opportunities that will see the food and they will come flying in and then you have like the whole Avery responding to one particular call and that's not the desired action. So what we did was um, we approached the birds as close as possible as we could get to them without them having any sort of reaction. They shouldn't start um, yabbing, they shouldn't um, feel pressured and then walk away. So we walked as close to the birds as we could. Then we rang the, the bell and threw worms. Then as we went on, it was more like the sound. We waited for a response that could either be like in the beginning, we just wanted a vocal response to the bell sound. And then we threw worms. Then we, over time, of course, we we walked um, not as close to the birds, so we wanted the birds to react to the bell by walking towards us. Um, and that way we slowly moved the birds closer and closer to the gate. Then um, we had to get the birds to react to the call when we did it indoors. So what we did was that we had a call where we did it outdoor as close as possible to the gate. Then we ended the session, went around the house and indoor, and then put our hand out through the gate and gave the, the cue from there. And then we could just throw some worms out through the gate. Um, 
and then over time slowly and gradually the birds started walking indoor when we then had the birds indoor then you have um, around here this is like a sand area that we have so in the beginning we just wanted the birds in here we, don't, we didn't use the gate at all at this time so we would throw the worms up here and we would be standing out here on the um, the keeper area and then the gate in the door into the um, the indoor that would be completely open so we could throw the worms from a distance so we wouldn't put any pressure on the birds then we wanted the birds to be more calm when they were in indoor in the beginning there was a lot of yapping and a lot of going back and forth uh, all the time so gradually the birds felt more and more safe about being indoor and then before we even started thinking of um, working with our, our gate um, we wanted the birds to be so desensitized to the indoor area and our objective was that when we had the birds as far away from the gate and that would be down in the water area down here um, and they would stand down there without uh, yapping or without fighting or just stand calmly down there or even eating the, the mealworms. That was the first time when we started about using the gate. There'll be a video later where you can see uh, the, the gate setup, how we've trained um, using gates. Um, but not right now, I'll just show you um, a little video of our stilts. So, this you hear here, this is our bell, and you see the birds coming. The good thing about our gates up there is that typically for keepers is that when you get the animals in, it's like slam and then the door is closed. For us, our gates, they move so slow and they are so noisy. So to have no response from the birds on that the gate is going, that's like super for us because then they don't care about it so it's all cool so this was um, how we did it for our black neck stilts it's sort of the same way procedure that we would use for uh, most of the species so this is um, the gate training how we trained gates with all of the species up there this is a very important part um, because you don't want that the birds feel that they just get slammed in, that the door just smacks behind them. And as I said in the last slide was that our gates move very slowly. Um, this part, don't rush it, because if you don't rush it, you'll get a much better result in the end. So what we did was sort of to say, we gave them remote control for the gate to the birds. So they had full control of the whole um, situation. What we wanted is, uh, just like the stilts, we wanted, this is a video of the um, black-faced ibis. We want the birds down on the, the ground section, down in the water. We want the birds to be calm and eating um their rewards so when the birds they are down there and calm and eating we can close the gate but the second one of the birds moves towards the gate will start opening the gate 
So that way, the birds always feel, well, I can decide when I want to be in or out. Then when they're super good at it, of course, you'll have to work on how long you keep the birds in, but do it gradually. Don't just think that you'll, yay, now I got them in, now I'll just shut the gate and wait until spring to open or the next day or anything like that. We did it like just for a short amount of time and then we would uh, open the gate again. Um, in this video, you'll see here, you'll see a lot of gate moving. <laughs> and that is every time a bird moves towards the gate, the gate will start opening. So they have the control uh, for the gate. With our black-faced ibis, they have been very, very insecure about coming in. So that's why the second we see them outside, this is a very early movie uh, of them, um, we we'll, would we'll want to throw the, the birds so they can see their food by coming in. So just like high speed, we just move the gate and here you saw one going up to the gate and the gate starts opening. And by all of this fuss with my gate going up and down, their gate opening, and the birds in the end started, they didn't care about the gate. So this is how we have been training, um, gate training, with all of the species up in the Avery. And until now, it's been working very well for us. The only species in the Avery where we have done slightly different, that is with our flamingo flock. Our flamingos, they have a long negative history about uh, keepers, and that's because we catch them for health checks. They were caught and put indoor for the winter time. So they have a very long negative history. So we tried on all the positive um, ways to try and get these birds to go indoor. But what we did in the end was a way that they have done with our uh, impalas at the zoo. So, to start with, we have a calm group of um, flamingos. We give a sound, that's the, the signal or the cue, um, to tell them that the next thing that's gonna happen is that we are gonna put a pressure on you. Um, so we have the birds reacting to the sound. The next thing is that if the birds, they stand still, then the keepers start moving. So we have, as you saw in the beginning, we have this lake and then the flamingos are down in the other end. So we could walk around the, the, the lake this way. As soon as the flamingo, they started walking towards the gate, the keeper would stop at the same second. Then we would just stand waiting there and enjoying the birds walking in. If then the birds stopped and walking the other way. Then we go back to giving the sound and then putting pressure on the birds, walking towards them, and then you get them in and we could close the gate. Here's a video uh, of the flamingo flock, how it works. In the beginning, we were two keepers, so we had um, one spot, one keeper would go out and stand on one spot and then the other one would be the one uh, clapping and moving around um, the lake and also managing the, the gate for them. At this time, 
It's only one keeper job. So here we have the flamingos, they hear the sound, they move towards uh, the indoor enclosure. Even is the thing is they have to move closer to me to walk indoor. If the birds then started that we have seen sometimes walking out of the, the indoor enclosure again, then we would give the cue again and then start walking again. But as long as they walk in calmly, we don't put pressure on them. This is super cool for us because the way that we manage this aviary makes it possible for us to have the birds out a shorter time each day. As you see here, normally when it was snow and frost, we wouldn't have the flamingos out um, normally. But because we train the animals and manage the aviary in this way, it's possible for us to get the birds out and get some exercise, uh, get some fresh air instead of just being locked up uh, for the winter. So status of the training in the aviary is that our Inca terns, they are 100% on their training. The same with the black neck stills, the scarlet ibis, the black faced ibis. Um, the flamingos, they're sort of like on 80. They do their training perfectly, but we see a huge, uh, a huge difference uh, throughout the year. We also want, we're working on that we now just can stand indoor in their indoor enclosure, give the sound and then walk out of the stable. So we are not at all out in the aviary when we do it. And then you have to walk in through the kitchen and out around the whole house and the aviary and then so so they can't see you and then when they go indoor first at that say that that time we'll walk into the aviary and um, close their gate so we are trying to put them over on positive instead of having our presence there Here's a video of our Inca turns. Our Inca turns, they are like super clever. And our Inca turns, they had that at a point they started training us. Um, so with the Inca turns, they're like the annoying birds up there um, because they always try and find the little loophole that is in your training and they'll always test you. We had to put in that we only could give free cues for every um, session we made or else the birds would just like we couldn't get the whole flock in at once it would just be like one coming in and then we would have to start uh, waiting and waiting and waiting and then one came in and one went out so we said it's there's only free calls and the birds that get in on that call they'll get rewarded the other birds They'll then come for the next training. We'll have to say that with the uh, Inca turn, Scarlet Ibis, Black Faced Ibis and Stilts, we have somewhere, depending on the season, we'll have from about two to 10 uh, small sessions uh, during the day. And thereby the animals, they, uh, they don't get in because of hunger, because we're starving them and they're coming in because they want to. Um, because they will always get their entire meal that is set for the day uh, every single day so we don't pull them in food the only time we pull them in food that is if they leave food they don't eat the amount that we're giving them then we will if we we say that um, the rule is if you get a hundred gram leftovers then you can cut them 50 grams um, and then if they eat those 50 grams you have to put them up again so that's how we manage it at a point um, the Inca turns because we had this little metal bar down here um, and for us we couldn't close the gate 
if an Inca turn would have a foot on that metal bar. If they were standing out on the, the ledge out here, it would be okay to close the gate. So the Inca turns, clever as they are, they started like just being super annoying, just like standing nearly, you felt like they were standing tapping on that metal bar because then we couldn't close the gate. So what we did was we put in a verbal command that would say, we're closing the gate. And then the birds knew that the next thing that was gonna happen of your indoor, outdoor, or in the middle is that the gate will close. And it took them like two days and they had perfectly learned that and they flew in uh, as soon as you uh, said that last uh, command uh, or call it a warning. Let's see here, so. The cool thing about uh, the Inca turn training is they get it nearly from, they learn it from when they're in the egg nearly. So up here you got the nest boxes and what we have uh, seen or heard is that when we give the call and we got young birds in the nest box, um, small hatchlings, they will start calling when they hear our call. So they learn the call already when they are in the nest box. This call here, we have adult birds, we have young birds, so it's, you can see that when we have the young birds, you have more like training where you have birds coming in and out. Um, and, um, but when we just have the adult birds, you'll just see them coming in. And here we first give the reward when the birds are indoor and the door is closed. So pros and cons, why do the training is like, you get more stress-free birds. We saw in the, in the beginning, before we started the training, we could see scarlet ibis when we came in or sort of like, just let's say most of the species up there, they would fly out except for the, the Inca terns when we entered um, the area where they were. So now we have more calmer birds. It's more time saving uh, because you don't have to capture birds uh, for the winter and you have a better health management of your birds and you get a better knowledge of the uh, individual bird. Um, for example, with the, as I said, with the scarlet ibis, we could never approach them just on the keeper area outside their indoor enclosure. They would just start flocking out the, the gate and see who could come out first. Um, so now we have birds that actually want to sit indoor when we are there. They're calm. We can give them rewards for being indoor. We can better have uh, breeding checkups for nesting season. We both got uh, nest boxes for the scarlet ibis indoor and outdoor. Um, you have them, they're more keen on coming to um, guest encounters. Uh, you can do feather clipping, uh, for example, with our, I haven't talked so much about our pelicans, but these videos are of the pelicans that you're going to see in a bit. Um, our pelicans out on a lake uh, with no net over. So here you have to cut the feathers um, up to twice a year to make sure they don't fly away. Um, we can get the birds in for winter. We can manage that we have like a shitty day and it wouldn't be a day you could have the birds out the entire day, but maybe you could just have them out like half an hour, an hour. They, it would be good for them to be out and then you can let them in and then you can let them out again later in the day and so back and forth and deciding on 
how much time they're indoor and how much time they're outdoor. For example, if we take our black neck stilts, before the training started, they would be in for around roughly four to five months a year because it was too cold. Um, now, if we if we like take the period that they would normally be locked up indoor, um, and we then say that you have some days they're out and some days that they won't be out and some days they're just a little bit out. In the end, it will be all gather up. It will be maybe that yearly over time, they'll only be locked up for roughly uh, a couple of weeks to a month, depending on how the Danish weather behaves. Um, so other pros are that the birds seek us instead of flying off. And of course, it's more fun. And the best part is it's a challenge. It's fun. It's super neat and exciting to get this to work. The cons? Yeah, you get a little bit more work. But when it's first learned, we don't spend a lot of time. Um, for us, it will take, let's say, roughly 10, 15 minutes. And we got all the species, uh, the birds in the aviary, uh, indoor, except for our ducks. Um, and that's like roughly 150 birds that will be indoor in their specific um, indoor area. So here you're going to see uh, two videos. They're coming right after each other. The first one is before the training. It took in man hours, if we calculated how many people we needed to be to catch these pelicans and get them indoor, it took us a whole working day, a boat, net, uh, and a lot of wet people, and even it costed us uh, a broken wing on one of the pelicans. And that was because we had ice and we needed to get them in. The video afterwards will show you how it can be done. So this is, of course, highly uh, stressful for the birds, even for the keepers. And it took a lot of people to get the birds in because the design of the lake, uh, so they could just like swim around us uh, all the time. Uh, and they're indoor every uh, area is on the middle of the lake. So this is how it can be done. So it's just like a little soda bottle filled with pebbles. So they come in. Super happy and cheerful. And what we figured out with these guys was because their gait is so noisy and they reacted negatively to their gait was that we would just talk and talk and talk about anything. So that's how fast it can be done. So piece of cake or... Yeah, at times it can be, but a lot of times it won't be. But the main thing is you need to know your theory. You need to have a team that is well functioning, a team where they all wanted uh, this to succeed. Um, you need to set some goals and stick to criteria. And that's by the whole team, not just individuals, the whole team needs to stick to the criteria that is set and not alter how you feed, what you feed, um, just stick to them. As with all training, stick to your criteria, And then maintain even at times when it seems completely hopeless. Let's just say, I will admit that there are times where I rather want to throw a bomb at the whole area and just make it disappear because the birds, they are on another planet, it seems. Especially when we come to breeding season, 
beginning of breeding season, mid breeding breeding season, end of breeding season when you have to get them up to, to winter set up. So what we have made is we got summer criteria and winter criteria. For us, the most important time of the year to get the birds in, that's in winter time. So we slack on our criteria uh, over summertime because that's where we focus on the breeding. And then we increase uh, when we end breeding season and uh, start nearing winter season. So, and the good part is that they don't stop all at the same time. So you can have one species that stops before another one. So you can start uh, more working towards winter criteria on them, increasing the amount of trainings you do um, and increasing the amount of response that you want from the birds. Um, where in summer times we see that many of the birds they are so focused on the breeding season that they don't um, either don't respond to the training or the calls or it's just like they're completely their mindset is another place but we maintain the training even so we just do less over the day and the most important thing is that when you are in these periods where the birds they're focused on something different that is that you catch every single opportunity that they give you so we have like a set rule for us uh, that we we agreed on that if you have a species that is not participating in the training because they're so focused on the nurturing their their chicks or whatever it would be if they then offer you behavior you catch it every single time and by that decreasing your criteria over summer and increasing them over winter this way we can manage our Avery all year round we even had like a, a black neck stilt that um, had broken its under beak, uh, the lower beak, and um, we we saw it out in the Avery, and we were like, that bird is never gonna come in. So, well, let's just try and see if it works or if it don't. So we rang the bell. All the birds they came in, even the one that had like the the lower beak uh, hanging, half of it dangling, um, came in. We could catch the bird after we uh, got them in, and then the vet could um, fix the beak, and it got some medication. And it was in the the flock was in for two days, and then they got let out in in, in the evening. We called them in, all of them came in. The same is it with the pelicans. You could call them in, catch them, cut the feathers, let them out. They would even come in uh, two seconds after you let them out again. So when you have enough pluses on your account that the bird think that it's super cool to be indoor and it's fun and they just like it, then the small negatives that you put in, they don't respond to them in a negative way. Yeah, of course, in the second, but afterwards it's like, well, I got more times where it's super cool to get, get indoor than I have times where it's bad to be indoors. So we have days where it is that our training don't work, but in the winter time it works and that's what's important for us that we can get them in in the winter and our public guest they can see them year round even in small bits over the day so keep notes as with every other training that you do they will help you tremendously over your training and to monitor the years, how much they eat, how many participate in your training. 
is there anything particular that is happening uh, over your training so what we have we have of course dates um, amount of trainers um, we use times the places we got different places uh, for example, for uh, the Inca turns where we can uh, give the call for them. So we have um, this one, that's the amount of trainers. Mostly it will only be one, but if it's outdoor in the Avery, uh, we will tend to be more trainers. Um, so they will have to figure out which trainer is calling and then coming to them. We have a motivation scale going from or zero, no response, and then to five, uh, that is good. So what we do when we give our um, score, that is we score the birds that participate in the training. We don't score the birds that don't participate in the training. So that we can always see over here how many of the birds came for the training. So we know that it's the amount of birds, for example, here it says 18. Those 18 birds responded perfectly to their call. And so they get a five. Um, and then we have out here, we monitor how much food that we give per training. <clears throat> so we got like, so we know how much we are, we're giving and using for the different trainings. And we can always go in and see Okay, is one trainer having issues with that not so many birds is coming? Could that be because they are giving too little rewards, so not all of them is going to get something uh, or whatever. So this is just super neat to have. And then you have got the, the last section out here that is uh, our remarks section where we just can put in small notes uh, about what's been happening. For example, have we catched all the birds for their yearly health check? then that might give us um, a reason why the birds wouldn't come in uh, 10 minutes after or whatever it must be. Just put in small remarks, try and make it easy for yourself and don't fill in too much information because what we've learned is that the more you have to put in, the less it gets done. So the more easy it is, the, less, the, the more information you get. So the year round, know your birds, year cycle, when is the breeding season, when are they off, when are they on, when are they in the middle and whatever it must be. So we have this um, chart or what's to call it, where we can see at what times of the year is the birds like super on and when are they like starting to slip off. The worst ones that we have, um, that's our stilts. <clears throat> So these charts make it super, super good for us because we can match our goals that we have for the birds to their season. So if we take, for example, uh, the stilts, we got the green area here. That's where they're just like 100% on. Then over here we have like when we start getting towards the breeding season, I'll say like stilts they have they're like nuts at times to say it um, because one little stilt can move around 62 flamingos easily if they want to um, and the flamingos they'll like running so this makes it easier for us to decide what will we expect of the birds in the given season and for example here from May to August, they're like nearly, let's say, nearly 100% off because they're so focused on maintaining their own little territory, maintaining uh, their chicks or eggs or keeping everyone at a distance. So at that time, we don't see them as much. Um, then when we get over here, uh, September, they start to slowly getting in again, and then October getting better. And then here, where it's super important for us to be able to get the birds in, we can get them in, let them out, how it fits us. The other species, they're like more easy. You can see them 
more green. Um, the yellow, that's just indicating that they're not like 100% on. So that's the period where we will lower our criteria um, and then we will raise them in the green area. So that's um, how we manage it um, here at the zoo. So thank you all for listening. I hope you haven't fallen asleep or closed the screen. Um, I'm happy to answer any question you got as long as I can answer them. So you can either tap them in here in the remarks or you can send me uh, an email uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that I got the answer for. So thank you for now.